um, that was focused on the conservation of the excuse me of the white-naped crane, which is a globally threatened species, and there's only about six thousand of them left. Um, and so, just before I get started, I want to tell a little bit about you know how it works in the Forest Service. So, in the Forest Service, there's three main kind of divisions of the agency. There's the National Forest System, which I work for, Milo works for. And then we also have our research, well I guess there's, there's four. Uh, there's a research branch of the Forest Service. Then we have a state and private forestry division, which helps you know, state, you know, uh, provides support to <coughs> states and private individuals with management of their forests. And then there's also an international forestry division. And so, um, uh, so this project was facilitated by the international side of, of, of the project of the National Forest Service. But, um, and you know, that, this district here works quite often with that division as well with the Crimby project that we've been, that Aaron and others have been working with. So as far as just orientation, um, Mongolia <coughs> is, um, is about, 600,000 square miles, and, uh, but it only has about uh, two and a half million people, uh, and it's kind of sandwiched, it's like this little dem democratic enclave sandwiched between China and Russia. Um, and this is the capital city right here, Ulaanbaatar, and of the two and a half million people, uh, about half of them live in the capital. So once you get into the countryside, there's um, there's hardly anyone in there. Come on in. Um, and I, I made this presentation originally when I was in Colorado, so you got to forgive me for not updating the slide. But this was uh, this was just put in there to kind of at the time give um, you know a little bit of perspective, you know, as to how the size of Mongolia compared to in this case Colorado. So uh, you know it's a fairly fairly big country, um, and this is a this is a photograph of the capital city, um, you know from the from the air, and you know you can see it's kind of a sprawling capital, you know classic kind of chaotic third world country environment with terrible pollution and just horrible traffic, um, and one of the things that's kind of happening particularly with, uh, in this country, is that there's a lot of people that are like leaving the countryside and leaving traditional nomadic lifestyles and moving to the capital city. Um, there's a lot of the kind of surrounding areas, you know, people are setting up their yurts, you know, it's kind of in Mongolia, it's traditional for the nomads to live in yurts and, and they live in them all year round and in the capital when they concentrate like that and they're all burning coal, the pollution is really pretty terrible in the winter. Um, once you get out of the out of the capital, um, you know this. You know the villages are very pretty simple. Um, you know there's really not much to them. They're, they're uh, you know you, you know, occasionally you'll have a gas station and just some houses, but this um, for the most part this would be like a you know, normal village in Mongolia. Um, heading. Uh, oops, I can, you know, but once you get very far out of the main capital city, the roads disappear. I mean, there there aren't really there isn't any infrastructure. You know, so once you know maybe an hour outside of the capital, you know, you, the roads are like this these kind of freestyle highways where people just drive you know wherever um, wherever they want to, um, and so you end up with this real braided. Uh, network of, of trails across the landscape, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it really makes you kind of respect the drivers that <coughs> drive in this area, because, you know, it's one thing to be the driver, but you also need to be able to, like, you know, take apart the engine and replace the steering column and put it all back together and get going down the road, because AAA is not coming to rescue you. Um, so, you know, we were out there, we went out to, to Mongolia in August, um, and again, we were working with the, uh, the, the field crew from the Wildlife Science and Conservation Center, 
And the objective of our project was to, um, there was really a, a couple of objectives, but one of the main projects that we did while we were there is we were going to capture um, either uh, fledgling, you know, pre-fledgling white nape cranes, so chicks right before they learn to fly, but pretty much fully grown, or molted and molting adults. And we were going to, um, you know, attach some satellite telemetry to them and track them to find, you know, where their staging grounds are, where their stopover sites are, and confirm the wintering locations. Um, because part of the objective of the telemetry work was to really, you know, cranes are, you know, they've got these traditional stopover sites that that's where they go. And, um, you know, part of the goal was to identify those locations so that the government of Mongolia could be informed, or the government of China or Russia could be informed about where these areas are, and they could hopefully collaborate to ensure that there's some protections from those areas, for those areas. <coughs> um, this is kind of a typical grassland step when you get out there. There's livestock um, kind of roam, that roam the, uh, the, the land, you know, there's no fences. You know, the only fence I saw in all of Mongolia <coughs> Once you were outside of a little town, was like I saw one fence around this person's potato patch, and other than that, there's no fences. The livestock just go everywhere. Um, as far as the white nape cranes and what we're, you know, this was kind of the assumed migration, is that uh, we know that part of the population, and you know, this is the Mongolia piece over here, um, part of the population we knew came down into China. There's a little smaller population from Russia that would winter in the demilitarized zone, kind of between North and South Korea, and some of them would drop over into Japan. Um, this is what the, what the bird looks like. This is one on, on a nest. And, you know, they've got a courtship display that's fairly similar to all any other cranes, you know, where they, they uh, you know, they pair up and then they do their courtship displays. Um, the travel route that we did, uh, you know, we got into the capital city and we pretty much went east. Um, and, you know, our travel route kind of mirrored the, the known nesting locations for where these birds were. And before we got there, one, one thing that we had done is we had the Mongolian team had, we had funded their kind of field team to get out in advance to find out where the birds were, because when it's time to capture them, you need to know exactly where they are. Um, and and you, have to, you have to know when they hatched so you can calculate when they're going to fly, because when you get there to capture them, I mean, you got you to gotta hit it just within a very small window. Otherwise, once they fly, you know, it's, it's done. So, you know, before we arrived in August, you know, this team had found the nests, they would calculated their age, we knew ex approximately when they were going to, the chicks were going to fly, so that we could do this route, and our goal was to capture as many cranes as we could. We ended up capturing, I think, 43, but we only put telemetry on, uh, I don't remember, like eight or, eight or so cranes. Um, you know, along the way, you know, these are domestic camels. Um, you know, I, I just put that picture in there because it was so cool. Show and the camel. Yeah, these you can see they've got the little, like a little nose uh, ring and then the, the rain on them. Um, but there was a lot of livestock grazing. You know, it's open range. Um, camels, sheep, goats, cows, horses. Um, you know, we're pretty much grazing all over the place. You know, there are, you know, the, uh, wild ungulates as well that are very, um, you know, herd, herded up, uh, but we actually didn't see many of them. What's the altitude? Um, you know, I don't remember. Is that brown area in the background due to fire or anything? You know, that's actually tills, which was very, very uncommon. You know, we started to see a little bit of this, and it's one of kind of the, you know, 
potential conservation threats for Mongolia is you've got all this like, you know, you know, it, it kind of struck me as what the Great Plains must have looked like before it was ever like settled and fenced and the, the, the grasslands were broken and tilled. I mean, it, you know, it was almost like stepping back into um, um, an era like that. But the, uh, the, there was very little actual agriculture, and part of it had to do with just the sheer logistics of how remote this was, you know, getting fuel there and equipment. But there was some wheat farming, and it's, uh, um, it's actually kind of one of the issues that we were encountering because they were, you know, using some pretty heavy duty uh, pesticides that were, you know, causing poisoning issues with um, birds and other animals. Uh, so that the, you know, small rodents can eat the wheat. Um, when we were when we were out there, you know, we had, because we were on a grassland, we arrived at the site, and you'd have to find the highest point you could to set up your spotting scope to find the birds. And um, and so you know, often that was the top of the truck. Um, this individual here that's looking through the spotting scope is the head of the of the uh, the ornithology lab for the National um, uh, University of Mongolia. And so we'd set up the spotting scope. The guy in the blue shirt was our driver. And, uh, you, know, you, you know, everybody kind of jumped in. We would, uh, you know, you'd have to watch the cranes because you'd be communicating with the capture team by radio. And they'd be in really thick, tall marsh grass. And so you'd be talking to them and say, oh, they're the birds, you know, keep going straight or, you know, turn to the right, you know, 100 yards to the right, kind of guide them in. And, and then you literally run them down and capture them. <coughs> you know, occasionally, like if a crane was, you know, pretty far out, we'd look around for, um, for a, a, a local um, nomad and see if we could borrow their horses. Um, and so you just kind of... Um, We'd, we'd, we'd go up to them and, you know, the you know, Mongolian team would explain to them, hey, can we borrow your horses? We want to go capture these cranes. And, you know, only on one case, you know, a guy didn't let us use his horse, and it was just because he had to go somewhere. You know, otherwise, he would have certainly let us do it. You know, everybody was very gracious and, you know, said, yeah, take the horses. And so these are, these are a couple guys from the... Uh, from the Wildlife Science Conservation Center, and they uh, they've got a crane chick right here. You know, this guy's carrying one. Um, you can see the horses were wet way up to the top of their chest. And when you look out across that, what looks like a meadow in the back, I don't know if you can see how some of the grasses have that reddish color to them, but that's all wetland grasses. And so when they see the birds out, you know, the birds might be, you know, half a mile out. And they, you know, they take off after them, and then the birds will start to run. And you know, if they can use the horses to do it, they they'll chase them down with the horses, and then you jump off the horse and you essentially just throw a, you know, they throw their jackets over them. You know, once they cover their eyes, they kind of lay still, and and then they swaddle them and uh, put a you know sock on their head to cover their eyes, and then just bring them back. <coughs> And so that's uh, this is this is what um, you know we would you know we bring the animal back and then um, <coughs> the uh, the individual um, from the National Mongolia um, University um, um, we call you know the Mongolian names are very hard to uh, pronounce but we call them seven. And uh, um, I mean, just tremendously complicated spelling on the name, or at least for an American. So is that um, a fledgling or a bullpen? That's a that's a, fle a fledgling. So um, it's got the nice brown color, none of the white on the neck. Uh -huh. And he's a kind of a classical ornithologist, so he wanted to take like all these morphological measurements, like every single bird that we caught. I mean, just they were measuring everything on these birds. And all I really wanted to do was like stick the telemetry on them and let them go, but um, but you know the locals, you know they they would sit down and you know they'd talk and 
as we kind of collect the, collected the data. Um, so they, these are some slides of them taking, you know, different measurements of the chicks and, um, you know, high, I mean, literally a way bill measure, everything was measured on this. Um, you, know, um, you know, they just wanted to get as much data as they could as, you know, they're handling the, the birds. And then we put the jewelry on them. And uh, um, what we've got here is we've got a color banding um, approach. And those are super light plastic. They snap on kind of like, I don't know, like big Legos or something. And um, and we alternate the color pattern. And if any of you have ever tried to read bird bands, you know, color banding is great because you can see, you know, you're like, is it a six? Is it a nine? You know, you can, I mean, if you're looking through a spotting scope trying to read a number on it, it's very, can be very difficult. Um, but, uh, you know, by alternating the colors, I think we had five colors, and you know, <coughs> I don't remember how many potential combinations there were of, of uh, uniquely marked individuals, but we, we didn't come close to what we were able to capture. And then this is the telemetry equipment, and this one was a, uh, satellite telemetry piece with a little solar panel on it. There's like a little neoprene inside it. So we, you know, before we put that on the, on the bird, you know, there's like some softer neoprene on there. We're definitely kind of worried a little bit about the, uh, the knee joint, how that weight might wear on that. Um, you know, we're still um, gathering information about, you know, hopefully it doesn't injure the, injure the bird. I think the color bands, these are so light that there's not really any concern, you know, the, the, um, the telemetry pieces, you know, is kind of more of an issue. Um, it'd be, it'd definitely be hard to capture these birds once they're flying. And then we'd let them go, and How usually... How the telemetry way? Uh, you know, it's a good question. Um, I'd have to, I'd have to look it up and get back to you on that. They were pretty light, though, you know, they, um, but then again, the birds are pretty, even though they're big, the birds are pretty light. Um, but they they did have this, you know, piece tested and used on. I know that they had used them on sandhill cranes. They used them on even some of the um, whooping cranes, and you know, so they they have you know tested the technology and they didn't expect it to cause injuries. You know, they had no trouble flying with these, um, and then we essentially let them go. You know, they. You know, we process the bird and then kick it back, and its parents would usually just stick around waiting for us to kind of finish that routine. And after that, we would um, usually be invited into the adjacent yurt for milk, tea, and bread. And uh, uh, and in this case, we're actually drinking Arog, which is fermented horse milk, and. Um, so that blue container in the back of the unit uh, is horse milk, and since they don't have any refrigeration, you know, they ferment it. It's, you know, very slightly alcoholic, but, um, you know, it tasted like, you know, like very acidic, like lemon, lemony, or not like a lemon flavor, but very acid, like lemon or vinegar. Like, I definitely couldn't drink very much of it. It was very, very strong flavor, but... Um, Nowhere to dump it out. <laughs> you know, but is that, is that a computer in the background there? You know, what was really fascinating is, you know, even though these folks were, it's not a computer, it's just a little plasma screen, but even though all these folks were so tremendously remote, a lot of them would have like a, uh, a little sa uh, a solar panel on their yurt and a little satellite dish. You know, <laughs> we'd, we'd like go in the yurt and they're like watching CNN or something. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Charging a cell phone, so you know they're definitely, and that's actually causing some of the cultural change that's happening in the country because the kids that's sitting in the yurt, they're like, "What? The world's different than this? You know, I want to go to the city." <laughs> and um, and this is another <coughs> shot of that. You know, you can see the kind of the padding that's in there. You know, I don't know. I, I we were a little concerned about the long term consequences of that, but of the, you know, again, I think we only did six birds with a telemetry piece. So they don't have some sort of default that drops off like rotten cotton or something like that? No, they those are put on, 
rivet guns, they're not coming off. Yeah. Um, and this is an adult, so in this case we caught a, uh, an adult that had molted its flight feathers. And catching the adults was um, just uh, um, kind of luck. We didn't expect to catch adults, but when you start chasing them and they didn't fly, then we thought, well, let's grab an adult. <laughs> so we ended up catching, you know, out of the six or eight birds that we put telemetry on, we ended up putting it on, I think, two or three of the adults. <clears throat> and, you know, we definitely want to wear safety glasses when you're handling these birds because they pop out an eyeball or something if you're not careful. So the type of data that we collect from this, um, uh, you know, they start, they start kicking out, you know, dots of locations. Um, and so this was two juveniles, and over here, that was an adult, and it, it was roaming around. You can see a little bit of these agricultural fields that were popping up. Um, you know, there's some more of the agricultural fields that are up north there. And so these were before they actually started migrating, and so these devices would, um, would kick out the locations and from that, what we were able to do is, is figure out, you know, their migration corridor for the birds. And so um, most of these birds all went down to Poyang Lake in China. Um, but we were able to, you know, you know, determine pretty specifically, like, the flight pattern, where they're stopping, how long they're staying there. Um, we, you know, simultaneously were working... Uh, International Crane Foundation, you know, has some staff in, in China, um, and uh, you know, we were working with the Chinese government as well, and uh, some uh, not national park down there near Poyang Lake on this project as kind of a parallel effort to uh, um, kind of loop them into um, loop them into the project. We tried to get them to come to Mongolia, but they couldn't get permission to, to leave the country. Um, so this is the this was kind of the objective of, of that project was to you know figure out where the stopover sites were and then over the course of a couple of years you know if you know we they determine like for example if this spot is always used as stopover sites you know then they can look at you know threats you know at that location to see if there's any opportunities for um, alleviating potential threats and hopefully make sure that that migratory path is, is a secure path for the birds. Um, these are just a, a few of the pictures. You know, in this case, we actually captured a whole family group. We caught two chicks and one of the adults. Um, and, you know, that basin behind us is like this massive wetland. You, I mean, it looks kind of like just a green, green um, dry grassland, but it's actually pretty just extensive wetland, you know, filled with you know, amphibians and um, uh, tremendous amounts of insects. You know, at the end of the day, you know, usually we, we just go camp wherever. So one thing that's kind of interesting about, you know, rural Mongolia is there's no land ownership. You can go wherever you want and live wherever you want and graze your cattle wherever you want and camp wherever you want. You just, there's, that's it. You just go do whatever you want. And so, you know, you just, you, usually we'd find like a high hillside away from the, um, where we might get a breeze. Um, and, you know, we'd set up our camp and then we'd go to the next location. They, right here in this slide, they're burning some dry cattle dung. And um, the, uh, that was to try to put a little smoke in the air to keep the mosquitoes away. Um, the, the mosquitoes were pretty intense um, because of all these adjacent wetlands, but occasionally you get a little breeze up on the, on the hilltop. Mm. That was the morning, you know, the kind of mosquitoes coming in for the morning feeding. <laughs> you know, and we would just set up, uh, set up the tents and, you know, occasionally the horses or whatever livestock would just kind of roam right through, right through the through the, um, the area. These are just slides because I thought they were neat pictures. 
Um, these were probably, from that one slide where we were drinking the air out, these are probably part of the horses that, I don't know how you milk a horse, but I can't imagine that they appreciate it very much. Um, so yeah. is, is a lot of Mongolia this kind of terrain, or is it? Is it? Yeah, you know, in, in the east, um, a lot of it's, you know, like, I'd say like the, mostly the eastern half slightly um, is, is what they call the Darien Steppe, which is a, you know, it's the world's largest temperate grassland in the, you know, the world's largest. So, uh, it's, it's a big, you know, huge temperate grassland. If you get down into the west, in the southwest, that's where you get in the Gobi Desert region, and it gets much drier. And then usually right in the very far north, right at the border of, of Russia, you start getting into um, Siberian pines. And you know, there are birch forests um, uh, that you know, we saw, you know, uh, you know, some pine forests. But you know, for the most part, you know, the people that live out on the, the nomads that live out on the grassland, I mean, this is a really tough life. I mean, they're, they're uh, you know, they, they live off their livestock and um, and that's about it. You know, so if they have milk and meat and milk and meat. You know, it's kind of so the horses they're keeping for? For milk, milk and meat. Okay. And, so they uh, are eating them. Oh yeah. Yeah, but they also use them in their, you know, um, in their uh, trading. So, you know, I mean, a lot of these folks do you know, they might have a motorcycle. It was interesting, you know, there's not, no gas station, but everybody wants the next thing, you know, and so these kids would be, even though they're incredible horsemen, you know, they, they all wanted a motorcycle, but you know, then they got to make money to buy gas, but whereas you know, they got tons of, uh, you know, horses all over the place. <laughs> you know, the infrastructure where it existed was like very questionable, you know, um, you know, some of the rivers we just kind of drove across, and here was a bridge that we were wanting to check out before we went across it. Um, Which river that would from? Yeah, you know what? So the thing, like with Mongolia, like it had only when we, you know, we were there um, last summer. Or what was that? Thirteen. Yeah, thirteen. Um, anyway. Um, you know, they, they've only been, they've only, like Russia's only been out of Mongolia for like 20 some years. So they're, they're like a real fledgling democracy. But there was, you know, while Russia was kind of occupying Mongolia, um, they, you know, they did put in some infrastructure. Like there were some wells, there was, you know, these old kind of towns in the north where, you know, it definitely looked like kind of, you know, you know there was a lot of, of influence of Russia and Mongolia from their kind of occupation of the country. Um, and so, you know, the government at the time probably, you know, brought in trucks, they went up into the mountains, got the wood, carried them down to make a bridge. Um, you know, but this was the situation with a lot of other crossings. This was like a, I couldn't believe this, it's like a comedy of errors, you know, I mean, we, uh, you know, we can pull up here in these blue trucks, like, you know, augered in the mud, and so we decide to drive in, you know, and then we get stuck, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, of course, then by the time we get out, there's another truck stuck, and, I mean, it, you know, by the time we left, you know, this poor little riparian area was just, like, you know, destroyed. The hydrologist that we brought along on the team was just, like, you know, <laughs> crying to herself that, you know, we've just done this to this riparian area. But, um, you know, there isn't any place, you know, you just kind of pick the best spot you think you can get across and go for it. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, in this case, there happened to be a tractor nearby, although I don't think that helped very much, but probably didn't hurt. This is in the, the farther north, up kind of near, almost to Russia. You can see that, you know, there's these really big, um, uh, you know, river systems up there. One thing, here's the, the one fence I saw that I mentioned. It's around this potato patch. It's the only, only fence that I saw on the entire trip. Um, um, you know, but here they've all, I guess they 
got one around the corrals too. In the north, they would actually corral some of their sheep at night because there's um, more wolves in this area. Um, this particular area, you know, the rivers here. Uh, one of the one of the threats that was kind of facing um, the white deep cranes was that the was is really climate change is in your face there. You know, Mongolia has a lot of permafrost. And so what was happening is the, um, the permafrost is kind of going deeper, and so the wetlands and the water tables are dropping, which is making the, the, the wetlands kind of shrink in size. And so some of them are actually drying up and disappearing, or really the water is just under the ground now. Um, and at the same time, the rivers, which are these really cold water fishery systems, the reason they're cold water fisheries is because of permafrost. It's like having a, you know, they're running over ice, and um, and they've got these, you know, great uh, like freshwater, you know, fisheries that people come to travel to experience. And you know, there's some changes happening in those systems as well. Um, we, these are uh, Dinazel cranes, which are a different. You know, that we saw five species of cranes while we were there. Um, I believe these are hooded cranes. These are my photos, not Milo's, so you can't really tell. I'm not yeah. judging. I'm not judging. Um, this is another Dimazel crane with some chicks. Not a very good picture, else either. This is a, a fledgling Dimazel crane that we had captured just to, um, to uh, just whenever we caught it, you know, spooked a bird. The ornithologist wanted to ban it no matter what, even if it wasn't our target bird. So, um, you know, some of the other birds, you know, were the Siberian cranes, which are critically endangered. Um, there's very tremendously small population of them left, and we actually did see a few of them in Mongolia. Um, the hooded cranes are an, another species. Uh, this was just a step eagle uh, fledgling that, you know, I just put that picture in there. And this is a, a picture of the grasslands, and I wanted to show you, you can see this, this hummocking, um, the kind of the bumpiness of the ground, and that's actually caused from livestock hoof action, where, you know, you know they've been running out there so much, and what that actually does is it actually creates these real subtle changes in the, in the ecosystem where you can get water, um, <coughs> You know, like the top of that, the elevations change is so different that, I mean, so subtle that you can get the top of the hummock kind of creating, being drier, and the bottom of the of the depression being wetter, and, and it can actually result in over time of, of wetland loss. Um, one of the challenges, you know, that we were facing in coming up with a kind of a conservation strategy for the bird was that, you know, there's no real way to regulate, you know, anything you can. You can, um, I mean, there's, and you don't want to go to Mongolia and say, here's how you raise cattle, because these folks have been doing it forever. Um, but, you know, it was, it was something that we discovered, you know, that if, you know, that very beginning slide I had, you know, you had the cows right in the wetland and then the, the yurt up on the hillside. And, you know, so their cattle and their livestock are watering, like right where people are getting their water, too. And so there are, you know, some strategies that, you know, the, the people could use to, you know, one, protect the riparian areas, you know, protect their personal health with their water quality, and actually, you know, get better management of the grazing system. Um, and so, you know, as a result of kind of our tour and um, uh, the work that we've done out there, we ended up, you know, coming up with an assessment kind of recommendation for the project um, and you know it has several several uh, parts to it one of them was we were coming up with a framework for kind of conservation planning for the birds but there was also a conservation education piece that we were working on you know where we're working on essentially kind of extension service type of education with the nomadic herders um, and also working through the schools there um, with the school children. And this year, uh, this summer, we actually sent a team back and they actually set up these like demonstration exclosures 
to show, uh, to one, evaluate, you know, um, what resting the landscape can do as far as recovery of the vegetation. And part of, it, part of it was to learn about how quickly the systems could recover, but part of it was also to teach the locals about, you know, kind of rest rotation systems of livestock grazing. And this is a slide that shows the solar panel and the, and the satellite dish, you know, which I, I just love that photo, you know, and all of, all of them, you know, they want to be connected, you know, be in there watching sports. Um, <laughs> You know, there's also these uh, swan geese. Um, I'll just put in some bird pictures. Um, and also a white deep crane and, and a white deep crane chick in the, in the front. This is kind of a team that we were working with. Um, you know, at the you know, beginning of the trip, you know, it was kind of this, this crew here, uh, mostly the Mongolian team, myself, and a uh, hydrologist uh, from the Forest Service, Liz Schnackenberg, who's a, a woman on the other side of the, of the picture. And then, you know, at like two-thirds of the way trip, through the trip, you know, all of the Crane Foundation folks arrived, including some of the um, funding individuals. And so suddenly, you know, like there was a cook and dining tent. And, you know, before, that, before that, it was very rough. But, uh, um, and then after that, you know, it's back to the city. And um, and fly out, and just you know some of the folks we worked with. This is Nimba Bayar. He's the um, the founder and director of the Wildlife Science and Conservation Center in Mongolia. Just finished his PhD at Oklahoma State, and now is back in Mongolia full time running the uh, Wildlife Center. He did his also work with the Peregrine Fund and is doing a lot of work with raptor conservation in Mongolia which is, you know, there's some terrible things going on in the raptors there just with the way power lines are being constructed in that co country. Um, this is Seven. Uh, he's the head of the ornithology lab uh, uh, um, at, the Institute of, at the Institute of Biology. And he was great. He was like 70 years old. And man, he could outpace any of those field techs. I mean, this guy just lived for field work and uh, did did a great job. I wish um, his English was better and I had any skill at all at speaking Mongolian because, you know, you know, I'm sure he has a wealth of information. And George Archibald uh, with the Director of the International Crane Foundation. And they've been sending, you know, people back. Like this year they sent another team. This next summer, um, International Crane Foundation is going to send more uh, their members have an opportunity to join this tour, you know, like the, you know, we send the advanced crew to get most of the field work done and then we'll bring in essentially the donor to show them what some of their funds are doing for cranes and, and in this case in Mongolia. And, uh, you know, and that's just kind of my parting shot um, picture. But I did want to just hit on a couple of things and then I'll open it up for questions, you know. You know, the main thing that that I kind of noticed when I was there um, was, you know, the Wildlife Science Conservation Center, they didn't really have a plan for what they were going to do with how you're actually going to achieve conservation. I mean, it's, you know, the, the real challenge in the country was, um, you know, the country's like 20 years old, they're working on economic development, you got China and Russia pouring across the border, you know, developing mining, um, uh, you know, opportunities, you know, it's completely unregulated. Um, I mean, there'll be like a, you know, track hoe digging for gold anywhere because of the land, lack of land ownership. Um, and, um, and so there was tremendous challenges to the government. And there wasn't really much of a, of a plan for how you're actually going to achieve conservation planning, in this case for for cranes, but what the team kind of ended up doing with the project is we ended up saying, well, really, we're, we're looking at this like grassland, wetland ecosystem and, and thinking about how do we achieve conservation, you know, for that ecosystem. Um, and uh, so we helped with kind of a, developing a framework for the Mongolian team to use um, in doing conservation planning. There was a little bit of work that had our foundation that had already been built um, by the Nature Conservancy and also 
from World Wildlife Fund. And uh, so those elements, you know, kind of came together to help provide a foundation for that planning. The conservation education was another piece. And then the, the third part, which we have started, you know, and con is continuing to go on, is kind of this tri-national cooperation between Mongolia, China, and Russia. And the U.S. is kind of more of a, has more of like a facilitator role in that, mostly through International Crane Foundation, but it's, it's got some financial support from international programs of the Forest Service. And, you know, that's looking at that full life cycle conservation. And so um, last winter, you know, the, the team went down to Poyang Lake in China to meet with the managers of the national park down there, talk about, you know, crane conservation, you know, starting to try to get the scientists connected across the migratory flyway for the bird. Um, and then there was also, you know, a lot of process of working through the Ministry of Nature and Tourism to figure out how to do like protected area management. So, you know, occasionally we went to, we did go to a couple of national parks there, but the difference between being in the national park and being out of the national park is there's no difference, you know, and, um, uh, you know, just, you'd have to know that you're in a national park. I mean, you know, there's grazing everywhere, there's, you know, farming, you know, and so there's not really any infrastructure or mechanisms for that. So one of the other programs is kind of a parallel project that the Forest Service is doing is they're actually working directly with, you know, some of the national parks and they've got a different team of like the planners and folks that work in the Forest Service to go and work with the park folks to kind of give them, you know, what we've learned about administering either parks or national forests and give them some advice. Not that they need all of our <coughs> crazy bureaucratic rules and regulations, but you know we've learned a lot about how to manage plans for you know multi-use, and um, and so there's a, a whole separate team of folks that are working with them on that. Um, and then uh, you know there were some other real basic things like you know here in the U.S. we've got um, like wildlife biologists to help us manage our fish and wildlife populations. Now, there's not a fish or wildlife management agency in Mongolia. It doesn't exist. You know, it's completely unregulated. So, you know, you know, if people want to shoot cranes or whatever, they just go and do it. And um, and so, you know, just the, the fundamental conversation of, hey, you know, maybe you need to think about, you know, how you might want to regulate, you know, management of your wildlife populations to ensure some some sustainability of that. But the, the challenges facing the country are so great that, you know, they're not really, they're not there yet. You know, they're, they're more thinking about how they feed their people and, and, um, and so, um, you know, you know, the one thing that was interesting is we didn't see a lot of terrestrial mammals, but the birds, particularly the water birds, were very common and the people didn't seem to kill them. Like they, there was like a, cultural respect for the water birds, but, you know, marmots and antelope and deer, you know, they, they're, they're, eat, they're on the table, you know, they, they eat them. Um, and then also the infrastructure development, like the power lines, you know, that was another thing that was kind of a side, uh, a side observations, like the power lines are real old school, you know, like nowadays with power lines, you know, they've got to be designed so that they don't electrocute raptors and these, you know, we were finding, you know, fried birds like under every, every 20 power lines we find a dead raptor. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones we find, you know, like the foxes or whatever, I'm kidding. So. Anyway, the project's still going on, you know, and they're going to send another team back next summer. Um, and, you know, they're continuing to kind of work on developing the assessment framework and, um, and you know, trying to kind of empower the local conservation organization to kind of lead this. You know, that's, that would be the end game is to make sure that the local conservation organization you know, just has some more tools to kind of accomplish their objective and also the objective of the International Crane Foundation. And, uh, so that's kind of the summary of the talk. Unless there's any questions. So do you think uh, human intervention has reduced predation on a lot of the birds? 
by by death of the raptors and, and mammals that might be predators and all that. You know, um, you know the predation on the cranes. Um, it's not there's that's not really so much of an issue. Their main predation would probably be from eagles. You know, it's potential that like raptor electrocution is affecting the eagles, but um, but really it's uh, the main threat doesn't have anything at this point doesn't have anything to do with Mongolia. It's water development in China. You know, they're they're taking these wetlands in China and turning them into hydroelectric energy production facilities and just flood these valleys that are wintering areas for the birds. You know, so hydroelectric production in China as well as, you know, climate change and kind of wetlands disappearing in Mongolia are the driving threats. And that climate change, piece, that one's tough. You know, I think what that really, the lesson there is, is conservation has to be focused on wetlands they think that are going to stand or stick around, you know, that might have some other kind of uh, perched water table that isn't dependent on the cross. Yeah, you know, Mongolia has got several fish species that are only found in that country, including some graylings. So it's, uh, they, they've got some unique uh, aquatic organisms. Yeah, the tame in there, that's what everybody yeah, talks about, the tame and the giant freshwater salmon. salmon. It's at like 100 and some pounds. Of, um, uh, you know, it's like this cold water fishery in the middle of the it's all permafrost, that's why it's cold. But yeah, there's that's that's definitely a part of it. I'd say Mongolia is like most certainly ground zero for some climate change stuff. A lot of the birch forests that we saw were, were dying or dead. And again, it had to do with the water table changing. And so fire frequencies is increasing and um, definitely a lot of change happening there. Mm -hmm. So kind of related to that, they, it's almost a desert, right? Like they don't get very much rainfall, so there isn't a regeneration to the wetlands from rain, and it's only from... Mongolia. Yeah, part of Mongolia is certainly a desert, like in the Gobi region, and this is, you know, temperate grassland, so it's, it doesn't get much rain, kind of like, you know, the Great Plains, you know, the, the uh, or, you know, front range of Colorado, the grasslands out there, you know, it's kind of short grass, it kind of reminded me of short grass prairie, which is kind of a low moisture, um, system, but uh, yeah, they didn't def don't get rain like Cordova. Do you know what the rainfall? <laughs> do you know what the rainfall I, is? I don't. In I'm the not area sure. That we were in? You know, I. I mean, it did look like. Yeah, I'm thinking like. Yeah, you know, they area. they get. Uh, you know, it's it's tremendously cold there, and they do get some snow accumulation that, you know, melts. Um, we definitely, in the two weeks we were there, we had a couple of rainstorms. You know, I don't think it was. Um, you know as arid as, say, the, um, you know, the grasslands of western Colorado, or eastern Colorado, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, Wyoming. It's definitely more like the grasslands of, you know, Oklahoma, you know, where they get more, more <coughs> intense storms that put down more, more water. So is the fact that there's no trees there due to the grazing, you think, or is that, would it actually be yeah, you know, I don't think so. Um, the the trees. So some trees or the, yeah, the trees. You know, once you got to some elevation, um, you know, there would there would definitely be trees. Um, you know, a lot of those systems, the grassland systems, historically would burn. You know, I think there's there's um, you know I don't I don't really know. <laughs> You know, it, I mean, most certainly, you know, when you got that slight kind of topographic north-facing um, hill, you could, you, there could be like birch or pine on it, you know, just real subtle yeah. topographic shifts, you know, which might increase the moisture just slightly, and you could, you know, trees would be there. That one shot you had, aerial shot, had some riparian vegetation in it in the earlier part of your song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can go back to that one. That one, uh, um, that was actually this one. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, the one yeah. by the potato field. Oh yeah, that that one was uh, 
you know, unique in that there was a big river system there. You know, a lot of a lot of it, you know, this area here was actually kind of like I mean, these rivers are essentially the sewage lagoon of the capital city. I mean, it's, it's you know, terribly um, unpleasant to stand near the wetlands here. Um, but uh, yeah, there's kind of raw sewage going into the rivers. <laughs> Does the Amur River go all the way to Mongolia? No, it's not Russia on one. On the inside. I, I believe it does. I yeah. I'd have to Yes. And I know the salmon in it. So Yeah. You know the uh, I do I do know that, you know, like the the tame and fishing was like big tourism business. And that's one thing that um, you know, in the report that we did share with the kind of Ministry of Nature and Tourism, we're like, you know, as far as like people that are coming here for like ecotourism, particularly the fishing stuff, you guys need to watch this climate change. Not that they can do a lot about it, but you know, most certainly it's gonna it's gonna you know affect the the fisheries there. But you know, the fact that it's completely unregulated, you know, people want to take these fish, or even from the sport fishing side, from tourists, you know, it's completely in the middle of it. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how much are the PTPs? How much do they cost? Yeah. They're around six thousand dollars each. Yeah. yeah, so we were that's why we only put out like six of them. <laughs> so um, that was uh, that was Which part of what PTP PTP the satellite, the satellite yeah. trackers, yeah. Um, that was actually part of what the Forest Service paid for with the international program grant. We paid for that. How long will they last? They'll they're solar powered, so they they'll keep going. You know, I think they're still kicking out data. Um, so you know, I think one of our birds actually got sick. It got uh, it ate some like. Um, pesticide laden wheat in a field in China and ended up in a zoo in China. And um, and so the colleagues in China actually went and got it and actually were able to retrieve the transmitter of that bird. You know, because it I wasn't sure they weren't sure if it was going to recover to be able to fly back. It was kind of a neat unique recovery of, of one transmitter. Did you see the uh, Danny damage to the bird from the transmitter? Yeah, I didn't hear anything about that. But, you know, that's a good question. I didn't actually think to ask. I got that picture sometime this summer that they captured the bird, but I've kind of just been filing these messages and not really getting in, not trying to follow it too closely. I've been busy with new adventures here. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Thanks. So I just want to mention next month, um, you know, it'll be the third week in March, and I'm pretty sure our speaker is Ann Harding, and she's going to talk about her workout in uh, Frigolosa. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anywhere? Sarah was there. Frigolosa. Right. Oh, right. St. George. Yeah. St. George. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, just we talked about it several months. March was when we talked about her doing it. So, and if not, we'll have somebody else. <laughs> and I got a flyer on the Elodia thing. If anybody wants to read that or is interested in doing that next week, it's gonna. Um, that's a workshop on the Elodia. I'll just leave that table. So. Okay.